Does truth exist? Because you have faith, does that make this book true? Does God exist? So when someone says there is no truth, if you apply the claim to itself, what should you say? Is that true? They don't think Christianity is true. They're talked out of it. You know why they're talked out of it? Because they've never been talked into it. Cross-examining skeptical and atheistic views. Welcome to Cross-Examine with Dr. Frank Turek. Is there really anything new that we can learn about Jesus from the New Testament after 2,000 years? When people tell me yes, I get skeptical. Oh, you've come up with something that Aquinas didn't see, or Augustine didn't see, or Luther didn't see, or Calvin didn't see, or Spurgeon didn't see. After 2,000 years, you've seen something new. Well, actually, I think you can get fresh insights into inarguably the most influential human being in the history of the world, Jesus of Nazareth, who wasn't just a human being, but also God. I think you can. And it's not just me who says this because my friend Tom Gilson has written a new book. It's called Too Good to Be False, How Jesus's Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. And the list of endorsements on this book is a mile long. I've endorsed it, but so has Lee Strobel, J.P. Moreland, J. Warner Wallace, Gary Habermas, Jeff Myers, Sean McDowell, Josh McDowell, and several others who are saying there are insights in this book that we haven't seen elsewhere. And the book is called Too Good to Be False. Tom Gilson, again, is my guest. He is the author of this new book, just came out August 1st of this year. And Tom has written six books. He's written over 600 articles. He's editor of stream.org. And he's also the founder of thinkingchristian.net, one of the top philosophical blogs for Christians uh, on the web. It's got several awards for that. Uh, Tom, before we get into the book, let me ask you one thing. First of all, how are you? And number two, tell our listeners what you do at stream, because I've mentioned the stream many times before, but I want, I want to hear, I want you to tell our listeners what you do at the stream. Okay. Hey, Frank, it's good to be here. I'm doing well. Thank you. And uh, I, I, I'm a senior editor at The Stream. I'm a columnist there. So that means I'm writing you know, four articles a week or something like that, but also help to just uh, set policy, set articles for The Stream. And what we do there, what we're doing there is we are, I would say, you can be biased and right at the same time, right? I think sure. we're the go-to place on the internet for a Christian perspective on current events. And that's what we're there for. We've got timeless stuff too. You do. And there are no ads on stream.org. It was started by James Robinson and, and Jay Richards. And uh, it's been up, must be close to 10 years now, maybe eight years. I can't remember exactly when it began, but I go there almost every day and you and others have written some great articles up there. Occasionally I'll put something up there, but you're a regular, you're up there all the time. And so many other writers, Michael Brown is up there quite a bit and several other Christian apologists, philosophers, theologians are on stream.org. So check it out. But let's get to your book, uh, Tom, because first of all, I, I mentioned at the top of the show that um, you can get some fresh insights from this book. And I think it's primarily because you didn't use an everyday Bible study method to yeah. to do so. What what do you mean you didn't use an everyday Bible study method? You you talk about this in the intro. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, everybody, when they when they study the life of Christ and for good reason, everybody studies what Jesus did and what he said. Well, I took a backward perspective uh, approach to that. I, I started thinking about what he didn't say and what he didn't do. Mm. And, you know, that could mean a lot of things. But in this case, what it meant is I, I was I was thinking about what do people, what do great leaders do? What do great, even what do other religious founders do? And, and what are they like? And how does Jesus compare to them? And the more I looked at it, the more I thought, Jesus stands out. He's different. There is no one. I, I even looked into to literature, mythology. You could go into Marvel movies. You could go anywhere and you won't find anyone who comes close to having the kind of character that Jesus has. In fact, let's talk about that a little bit, Tom. When you say what he didn't do, that's one of the things I put in my endorsement because you were looking at, OK, yeah. what, what Jesus didn't do is almost as amazing as what he did do. So give us a couple of examples of what he didn't do 
that stand out and give us a fresh insight as to who Jesus really was and is. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about uh, his most famous sermon. And by the way, if, if anybody else, this is one thing he didn't do is he didn't, uh, he didn't get better as he went along. Mm. You, you listen to anybody else who's delivering their first sermon. Of course, we don't really know if this was his first sermon, but it was first in Matthew's timeline, at least. Uh, you listen to anyone else giving their first sermon, and they're not going to do what Jesus did, which is deliver a sermon that people are going to talk for two, about for 2,000 years to come. Yeah, he, he got it right the first time. But the other thing he didn't do in that sermon is he did not say, thus says the Lord. He never said that. This is surprising because in the context in which he was uh, speaking and teaching, uh, you look at the prophets that came before him and they, they were all speaking as if speaking the words of God. Right. But they mm. said, thus says the Lord. Jesus comes along and he's speaking with the same authority as if speaking the words of God. But he wasn't quoting anyone. He was speaking on his own authority. And he did that everywhere he taught. He he spoke on his own authority. He, if you know, if you were looking at the at the thing on a on an academic page, and he had to footnote everything and say what his source was, every footnote would read me, Jesus of Nazareth, nobody else. Mm. That's different. And you, you you heard him say things like, "Well, you have heard it said, but I say to you," or or he say, "I a new commandment I give to you." What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and then he also says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Really? You're just a man? So he didn't say what the Old Testament prophet said, thus saith the Lord. He just assumed he was the Lord and said things like this. What else didn't he do that you could uh, lay out for us that could give us a fresh insight as to who he is? Yeah. Well, he never said, uh, this is an interesting one, the way I, I, I've I, I first caught this. It, it goes back to a while ago when I was, I ran into a, a young 20 something guy who wanted to know more about Jesus. So we set up to meet at, at a bakery coffee shop and well, his dad came along and it turns out his dad was a would be cult leader. Mm. Now, I say would be because he didn't have any followers, but his beliefs <laughs> were pretty cultish. And we had five spread out over four different States, but you know, he, he kept saying to me as he was describing his his beliefs, he kept saying, my father says this, my father says this. And, you know, he claimed to get it from the Bible. Yeah. Well, that bothered me. So I went home and researched and I thought, who says my father in the Bible? And I came back and asked him that. And he said, well, the disciples said my father. No, uh, Jesus said my father. He never said our father. And that's where he said he didn't do something that everyone else might do. He, in fact, he told us to say our father, but he never did. It's it's striking. You go to the resurrection account at the end of the book of John, and he and he tells Mary, go tell uh, my, the, the disciples that uh, I go to my God and your God, to my father and to your father. He's really careful to keep that separate. Why? Because his relationship with the father was different from our relationship with the father is a totally different kind of relationship. In fact, yeah, you even so much say different. in the text that Jesus never claimed to have faith in God. Yeah. That's, that's kind of a striking observation. He never said, I have faith in God. How so? And we only got about yeah. a minute before the break. Give us, give us, and we can continue on the other side of the break, but go ahead, Tom. Yeah, we'll probably need to. The, the, the rest of the Bible, you never see, uh, no one ever says Jesus had faith in God. That's really weird because there is nothing he taught more than the importance of faith. And the other things that he taught, like love, compassion, uh, re giving, that kind of thing, he, he, he demonstrated. But he never demonstrated and no one ever said he had faith in God. That's that's really weird. Uh, a good teacher ought to demonstrate what he's teaching, right? Mm. Uh, was Jesus a hypocrite? And that bothered me when I first noticed that. Well, let's unpack it further on the other side of the break. Why didn't Jesus say he had faith in God? You're listening to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist with Frank Turek on the American Family Radio Network. My guest is Tom Gilson. His new book, Too Good to Be False, How Jesus' Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. 
And we're going to talk a lot more with Tom and get new insights into Jesus. Yeah, we really are. Don't go away. Friends, can you help me with something? Can you go up to iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast and give us a five-star review? Why? It will help more people see this podcast and therefore then hear it. So if you could help us out there, I'd greatly appreciate it. Welcome back to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist with Frank Turek on the American Family Radio Network. I want to mention that this Sunday, August 16th, I'll, I'll be doing a local gig here in Charlotte, North Carolina, Freedom House Church, uh, right here in Charlotte, not far from Concord Mills Mall up that way. For those of you in the Charlotte area, I'll be speaking at the 930 and 1115 services. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist will be the topic. Freedom House Church, go to our website, crossexamine.org, click on events, you'll see that there. And a little bit later, I'll mention some new online courses we've got coming up that you want to be a part of. But right now, my guest is Tom Gilson, and his new book is called Too Good to Be False. It's a book with some fresh insights about Jesus, believe it or not. We've been talking about a couple of them just before the break. And just before the break, Tom, we were talking about this idea or this uh, this uh, observation you made that Jesus never said I had faith in the Father or faith in God. Why not? Yeah. Well, the first thing you, you want to say, Jesus was not a hypocrite. And, and you know, we don't want to come to that conclusion. That would be that would certainly be wrong. Mm -hmm. And you certainly also wouldn't want to say that he lacked trust in the father. That's not what's going on here because their relationship was was so close. I, I think what's going on here is probably something like you, you might say, you know, I have faith that I can complete this huge, long project. Why? Well, because you, you're pretty sure you can do it. You have good reasons. You have belief. What you don't say is, I have faith that I can scratch my eyebrow, mm -hmm. uh, unless you've got some kind of medical or something going on. Uh, because there's just nothing in there that's in question. Faith is about something that you know, you have good reason to know, but it does imply that there's something in question. I think that what's going on with Jesus and the Father is that he's got the kind of trust that where nothing is in question. So it is it is trust, but it's not the same kind of trust that we have with the Father um, where where we have to push through something that is at least at risk or something that's that's being ventured that we got to we got to see what God's going to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Go ahead, Dom. Yeah, I'm saying, does that make sense? Oh, yeah, it does. And, and, and okay. if you folks listening, if you get the book Too Good to Be False, that, that's unpacked at much greater depth than we could discuss here on the radio. I want to mention one other thing I heard Tim Keller say not long ago, which I thought was insightful. We were talking earlier about how Jesus always says, my father, my father. Um, but there's one place that he doesn't say my father, and that's when he's on the cross where he says, my mm -hmm. God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I wonder if that had to do the, with the fact that he felt at least in his human nature, that he was forsaken judicially because he volunteered to go to the cross, but still it was an injustice for him to take that punishment on himself so we wouldn't have to experience the punishment. And it's the only place where he says, my God, rather than my father, that that in that instant, he he felt like that relationship had been broken, at least judicially. Yeah, I think these these details matter. And mm -hmm. I think they do tell us something. I, I think you're on the right track. I think Tim Keller's on the right track there. Now, Tom, this book, which many have, as I mentioned earlier, have endorsed very wholeheartedly, um, have written such great endorsements for it. But really, who's it for? Is it for the academics or who's it for? Because I read it as as anyone would read it. And and I think it's, it's written for everybody. But who are you really trying to get this book to? Yeah, I'm really trying to reach the the the, the pastor, the the teacher, the everyday cre uh, Christian. Mm -hmm. That there's something there for for everyone. I was actually gratified. Oh, by the way, it's also for groups, and I, I'm hoping people will read it and study it in in community because there's discussion questions in the back for that. But I was gratified to get an endorsement from Craig Evans, distinguished professor at uh, Houston Baptist University, who said, uh, he said, although it's oriented for the general reader, including, here's the other group, skeptics, 
Um, we'll get into that, I'm sure. He says the professionals will get a lot out of it, too. It's That's apparently right. reaching uh, because of these new ideas. It, it, there's something in there for even though it's written to be very readable, it's something in there for academics as well. Well, it's the angle from which you're looking at Jesus. You're looking, as we mentioned earlier, from what didn't he do? What didn't he say? <laughs> Mm-hmm. In, in fact, think about right. a man with Jesus's, well, if there is such a man, if a, 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 a being with Jesus's obvious power. OK, he could yeah. heal people, raise the dead, calm the storm, could do all the things that get us into trouble. That's why he's the Messiah. Right. You know, right. he 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 heals us. He comes. He has power over nature. He can raise the dead. He's sinless. These are all the problems we have. He's demonstrating to be the Messiah. But did Jesus ever do Anything that would give him personal benefit, it, it seems like he, he he never pulled rank. He never decided that he was going to do something just for his own personal benefit. Even the Apostle Paul, who apparently had the power to heal, couldn't heal his own thorn in the flesh. This seems odd, doesn't it, Tom? And that is actually the most striking thing to me about Jesus' character. It's actually the one thing that takes it from from the from Jesus deity being a doctrine to Jesus being the god whom i have to fall down before and worship hmm. i i just I, because here's the thing he had all this power and he never used this extraordinary power for his own benefit at all if 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 someone gave me you know let's talk economic power if someone gave me uh you know the the powerball winnings or something i i got a billion dollars all of a sudden and if i was the best person you ever heard of uh except for jesus you know i would and if i gave it to missions and to feeding the poor and to you know ending human trafficking if i were that good i'd still probably get the roof fixed <laughs> or or, or take, you know, take the family on, on, on a nice vacation or something. But Jesus, when he was hungry and he could have turned a stone into bread uh, and he was tempted to do so, he said, no, that's, that's not, you know, that's, that's not the point here. We don't live on bread alone. He was, power corrupts, said Lord Acton, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And Jesus was absolutely the opposite of that. He was absolutely uncorrupted. In fact, I just nothing to be else like that. I, anyway. I, I just happened to be reading in Luke this morning that uh, where the uh, soldiers were mocking him and people standing at the cross were mocking him. You know, if you're the Messiah, why don't you save yourself? You think you can save others? You can't even save yourself. And he he didn't save himself. But of course, he could have. He could have. Yes. You know, he's the only person who died and didn't have to die. Mm-hmm. We all, you know, we can choose how we die. We can die for the Lord. And I hope that we all die, uh, you know, speaking his name. He didn't have to die. He didn't even, didn't even have to be born. Uh, there was a guy in India a couple of years ago who sued. This is funny. He sued his parents for a wrongful birth. Mm. And he, uh, you get the sense that if he, you know, if he'd maybe had uh, advanced informed consent, it would have been okay. Well, Jesus came with advanced informed consent before he was born. Yeah. And he came for us. Yeah. Just imagine knowing what Jesus knew that he would be sacrificed some, sometime in his early 30s that mm-hmm. he would literally be sacrificed. And, you know, all the years leading up to that yeah. the amount of stress that if it was just a normal person, he was a normal person like us. You know, we, we probably couldn't handle that, but. No he knew that was coming and uh, he volunteered to do it, which is, again, amazing. In fact, the first part of your book, again, we're talking to Tom Gilson, his new book, Too Good to Be False. The first part of your book, Tom, is a section. Part one is called Greater Than You Knew, which is talking about Jesus's character here. Um, mm-hmm. And let me just quote something you write here. You say, uh his love is unmatched in all history and all literature. His ethical goodness is unparalleled paralleled in all history and even the greatest author's imaginations. His teaching met- methods may look simple, but you can't call a teacher simple who gives each person exactly what he needs, who never gets the least bit flustered, much less stumped when the best scholars of the day also happen to be his chief adversaries. 
constantly trying to trip him up. You elsewhere say no author, no novelist, no poet, no playwright has ever devised a character of perfect power and perfect love like Jesus. You say people like Shakespeare and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, all these different different uh, playwrights or poets. They couldn't create a, a figure like Jesus. And then you write this. Yet skeptics think the anonymous storytellers involved in the story distorting processes of cognitive dissidence reduction, legend development and the telephone game did what none of the great none, what none of the greats ever imagined. I say that would be a greater miracle than Jesus's resurrection. So start with Jesus's character and then we're going to talk about how the how he couldn't be an invented character like you mentioned here in the text. Yeah, this is the part where it's for skeptics, but also to encourage Christians in their confidence in the faith, which is um, Jesus. Uh, what I did, and it's, it's also different in this book, is I took the story seriously as a story, and I took Jesus' character seriously. Uh, I even uh, set aside the miracles, just saying, what's, what's his character like? And and we've already talked about how great he is. Um, and, and so... Stories always come from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. you, you've got to explain uh, the, the story according to its author. And, and, and it's got to make sense as to who could write a story like this. You don't have, um, as I say in the book, you don't have a hockey player uh, writing a novel about life on the road as a concert pianist. It, it just wouldn't make sense. So does the backstory, the explanation for the story fit the story? That's the you, you, you got to take it seriously as a story. And so the skeptics have a backstory. Christians have a backstory. Our backstory is that it's true. And, and the backstory fits the story. It, they, they go together. The skeptics have a backstory, which is that the, the whole thing, as you summarize here, came by processes that are guaranteed to distort. Um, the, the list you gave there is summarizes all of part two of the book. It starts with the... The, the disciples uh, were following an actual man named Jesus. The skeptics will go that far and now and allowing his reality, but he died and done. You know, what do you do? He's done. He's gone. Uh, all their hopes pinned on him. They invested so much in him. There's a deal that psychologists talk about called cognitive dissonance theory. And it says that when that happens, sometimes people will find a way to make it true after all. So they did. They made Jesus uh, rise from the from the grave, even though it wasn't true, uh, real. They they told the story so that he could still be their Messiah, and then to, and in order to reinforce that, they had to evangelize everybody into believing it with them. And so the whole story of the resurrection started from this messed up place of um, these guys are are really psychologically unhinged. Yeah, yeah, that's not a good start for a for a story for the ages. No, and as you say, it would take it would be a greater miracle to say that the Jesus character in all four accounts, all four gospels, came out the way they did through this process of cognitive dissonance and storytelling and legend development in the telephone game. And we'll get back to this right after the break. You're listening to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist with Frank Turek. My guest is Tom Gilson. His new book, Too Good to Be False. We're back in two. If you find value in the content of this podcast, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Join our online community to have great conversations, grow in your knowledge of God, and become a better defender of the Christian faith. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we have hundreds of videos and over 100,000 subscribers that are part of our online family. Find us by searching for Frank Turek or Cross Examine in the search bar. You can find many more resources like articles, online courses, free downloadable materials, event calendars, and more at crossexamined.org. Did the Jesus story develop over decades and decades? Was it really just invented and made up a lot of wishful thinking? Because that's what some of the skeptics are saying. But my friend Tom Gilson, who's written the new book, Too Good to Be False, challenges that and said it would be more of a miracle to have the four Gospels as we have them come out the way they did by that process. And Tom, can you explain what skeptics mean when they say, well, say the telephone game or uh, how they think legends developed 
uh, in the New Testament. What what process, if you could describe it a little bit, what process do they say gave us the four Gospels that we have now? Sure. Yeah. N- not every skeptic is, goes with every detail on this, obviously, but pretty typically what they're going to tell you is that it was uh, oral tradition spreading around the whole Mediterranean region, especially Asia Minor and Europe, also maybe North Africa. And uh, Bart Ehrman, who is the number one selling writing so on, uh, skeptic on this mm-hmm. topic, he talks in three or four of his books about the telephone game, which he says, you know, it, it spreads across you know, country to country, language to language, and like one child whispering into another child's ear, and then it goes around the, and around. And, and he says, what happens to stories when you do that? They change. And I look at that and I go, change? They don't just change. They get screwed up. They get distorted. They get corrupted. And that's where skeptics, especially Bart Ehrman in this case, will tell you that the story of Jesus came from. And and they'll say, well, just look, you know, we got a different number of angels at the tomb between different uh, Gospels. And so that's just a sign that it got corrupted. It, it's messed up. And I, I go, OK, you're looking at the twigs, not just the trees. You're, you're missing the forest for the twigs. There is a character in this uh, in this story who is the same character in all four uh, landing points, you might say, all four Gospels, uh, landing points for the telephone game thing. He's the same character. He's perfectly consistent. He's perfectly unique. And he's really, really good. Does that sound like something that came by uh, this, what I call story scrambler process? Yeah, it wouldn't have happened in one Gospel, much less four to have right. that process. And remember, these these texts were authored in different places. It wasn't like they were all in contact with one another either. Now, maybe they had similar sources. For example, Luke was not an eyewitness, so he checked different sources. Uh, Mark, we, of course, believe was really giving the recollections of Peter. But Matthew and John were eyewitnesses. It would take a genius, as you put in your book. Again, the book is called Too Good to Be False. You say to invent Jesus would have required genius beyond Jesus. Be beyond genius, I should say. Yeah. Would have required genius beyond Jesus, a genius. And uh, it just seems like more of a miracle, as you put it, Tom, to suggest that these four Gospels with this supreme character of Jesus in it, that not even novelists, the greatest no- novelists of all times, could have created – It seems to be more of a miracle that this could have happened by this scrambler process or telephone game process, you said. Yeah, and and it it seems like at least one of them would have messed up and have Jesus say just, thus says the Lord, Mm -hmm. if this was where it came from. Or one of them would have come along and would have had Jesus saying, our Father. And there were so many ways that they could have, in details, gotten him wrong. And they didn't. And and so, you know, was there one master editor who put them all together? They just don't read like that. It's it, you have to look at the Gospels and say, do they read like they came from this source? And and they just don't. They don't read like anything really other than true reportage, which is a, a term I get from Lydia McGrew, who studied this a lot and then written about it in in uh, for this purpose, especially a book called Hidden in Plain View, which covers uh, similar types of topics from another angle. It's it's true reportage. Yeah, I, I think the question is, and you have it uh, worded a little bit differently. Uh, you're quoting somebody here where you say, did the record invent the person or did the person create the record? We might be able to say it this way. Did the Gospels create Jesus or did Jesus create the Gospels? And it really seems much more plausible to suggest that Jesus created the Gospels in the sense that he really existed. And then they wrote it down. It wasn't as if Matthew, Mark, Luke and John got got together or separately and said, let's come up with a a fictional character called Jesus with all these characteristics. That would take more of a miracle than to just say there was a person named Jesus who didn't said and did these things. And we recorded it. Here they are. And so. In fact, you you also say um, uh, you quote, you say, I love this line, quote, the poets must have been superior to the hero 
any inventors of Jesus would have had to surpass Jesus himself. And then you write plausible with a question mark. Is that plausible? Yeah, I don't think that's plausible. And, you know, the interesting thing is I've um, as I've dealt with uh, which what I call Internet atheists, people who just you know pop in on comments on, on blogs or on mm -hmm. the stream articles I've written and they want to contest this. You know, what they typically say was that, you know, Jesus wasn't that good after all. You know, he didn't um, he didn't condemn slavery. Um, and, and so, well, first of all, he had reasons for not condemning slavery. He wasn't here to to start a, a political and economic revolution. He came to start a spiritual revolution. Although he did uh, say, I came to set the captives free, quoting from Isaiah, when he started his ministry mm -hmm. in Luke chapter four. So he did say that. But I agree with you. He's not here to create this big political revolution against the Romans. He's here to create or to be the sacrifice for the entire world so right. he could then change hearts and then change the political system. Right. And and he did also, by the way, teach the golden rule, which has something to say in the same topic. But here's the thing that with everything so far that I've heard from skeptics, there's something that they miss, which is let's let's just um, for the sake of argument, say, OK, Jesus could have done that, but he did, not you know, just for the sake of argument. Here's what I see going on here is we've got uh, examples of Jesus per perfection. And the most uh, the, the, the clearest one is the way he has all this power and only uses it for others, uh, unmatched in all history and literature. And and what these people are doing when they point at these things that are supposedly wrong with Jesus is that they're like they're out they're out on the beach, they're out on the beach, and and you pick up a diamond that you just found in the beach and it's four carats and it's sparkling and it's beautiful, and they say yeah but look at all the sand, and, and I go well, wait a minute there's a diamond here and they say yeah it's a lot of sand, hmm. uh, where, where did the diamond come from, and. They, 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 there has to be some kind of an explanation for that. Even if you're not sure you like all of Jesus, there's something there that their legendary processes just doesn't explain. And by what standard are you judging Jesus? That's the question I have. I hear a lot oh, of Christians yeah. out there are now disagreeing with Jesus on sexual issues, on marriage, you know, on heaven and hell. And I'm going, mm -hmm. really? You call yourself yeah. a Christian and you disagree with Jesus? Why don't you just stop calling yourself a Christian if you're not following Jesus? That's what Christianity means to follow Jesus. But sure. Yeah, and I'm only granting for the sake of argument. I, you know, and I, I wouldn't give up what you're saying for a second. I I I'm I'm going with him as the leader. And the guy who knows what he's talking about. And and so, uh, you know, my my theory on when I have a problem with the Bible, with what the Bible says, uh, the problem is not with the Bible. The problem's with me. I better work on that. Yeah, in fact, that's true. And Augustine said that if we think we found some error or problem in the scriptures, either you got a bad translation, you have a bad manuscript or you just don't understand but to say mm -hmm. that Jesus was wrong is not an option. <laughs> it's no, not it's an option. Not. By the way, how do you interpret the Bible? That's one of the online courses we have coming up. It's a brand new course, and I'm going to be leading it beginning September 7th. And on the premium version, I'm going to be live with you on Zoom for several Q&A sessions. So if you want to be on the inaugural launch of how to interpret your Bible, uh, sign up. Just go to crossexamine.org, click on online courses, and you'll see it there. That begins September 7th. Hope to see you there. Tom, I've never been at a church that actually had a course on how to interpret the Bible. That's why we started this course here at crossexamine.org. How do you interpret the Bible uh, is an important question. But your oh, book, yeah. Too Good to Be False, is, is a book that I think everyone should have. And just in our conversation today, I hope you folks have realized that Tom Gilson here has taken a different approach to Jesus. What didn't he say? What didn't he do? And what kind of character could create or what kind of writer could create a character like Jesus? The answer is no one. He's an authentic person from history. And just who was he? Now, in the second part of the book, uh, Tom, and we're, we're, we're kind of skipping around here. We're trying to cover That's a lot right. in a short period of time. The title of the second part of the book is Too Good to Be False. And you kind of summarize the case for the historicity of the Gospels. Can you kind of give a quick summary here as to why you think they're historical, other than what we've already spoken about? 
Yeah, well, just uh, they have to be historical because there's no other explanation on record that fits. The the skeptic scrambler idea doesn't fit, and they don't have another one that I that I'm aware of. And I've done the study. It, it doesn't. We don't know where they could have come from unless they came by way of true reportage. So I think that you know it's too good not to be true. It's too good to be false. And in fact. Uh you point out a couple of embarrassing details in the book uh, that I've been mentioning for quite a while and others have long before me that there's embarrassing things in there that they never would have invented. Like they never would have said that, you know, uh, Jesus said, God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They never would have put that in there. They never would have had the, uh, the uh, women be the first witnesses or the disciples ran away when the crucifixion occurred. None of this would be, or Peter would have denied Christ three times. They, were, they never would have made this up. And so there's a lot of good circumstantial and good historical data that shows mm-hmm. that the, the person that you read in the gospels is the person that actually existed on earth 2000 years ago. And the question is, what do we do with Jesus? And in the, in the third part of your book, Tom, which is an entire section here, you call it Jesus, no matter what. What's that about? That's about, we are heading into an age, and and actually everybody in in their lifetime has had to ask, you know, am I going to follow Jesus uh, through whatever I'm going through? But we're heading into a stage, I think, in history, in the where for the first time in the Western world, the the question is, are we going to follow Jesus when it is following Jesus in in itself that's causing us the trouble, Mm. uh, that's causing us the pain. In other words, we're being persecuted for our faith. Will we follow Jesus no matter what through that kind of a thing? That's the question now. Yeah, let's talk more about that right after the break. That's a timely question as we have entered the cancel culture. And if you don't agree with the cancel culture, you could be in trouble. And Jesus does not agree with the cancel culture. And if you agree with Jesus, are you going to be canceled? Well, we'll get into that in a little bit more about Too Good to Be False, how Jesus' incomparable character reveals his identity by Tom Gilson. I'm Frank Turek. We're back in just a couple of minutes. See you then. Friends, Frank Turek here. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is a listener-supported radio program and podcast. So if you like what you hear here, would you consider donating to crossexamined.org? 100% of your donations go to ministry. 0% to buildings. We're completely virtual. So if you can help us out, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Welcome back to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist with Frank Turek. And after listening to Tom Gilson, you shouldn't have enough faith to believe that the New Testament documents are legendary. You can't create a character like Jesus, especially four different versions of him that agree on the core of who he was. Jesus of Nazareth really existed. The question is, who was he and why did he come? And uh, Tom, you write in the book, again, the book is called Too Good to Be False. Everyone should get it. Came out August 1. To, as of right now on Amazon, it's got all five-star reviews, 15 of them. And uh, the list of endorsers is uh, the, a, a list of who's who in apologetics and uh, people who are interested in Jesus studies. But you say this in the book, Tom. I, get, wanna get to, I wanna get your comment on this. You say, for those who think there is a menu to choose from, I say, scratch Christianity off it. It doesn't belong there. God offers no menu, no alternatives. You can choose between not even one you can label as, quote, right for you, unquote. If plan A was God the Father allowing God the Son to suffer and die, then there can be no plan B. It's life in Christ or it isn't life at all. Unquote. Now, Tom, that sounds a little bit narrow. What do you say to that? <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, Jesus is good. And we are, if there's anyone you want to follow in history, you pick a good example. And he's the one. But people will say, yeah, that is narrow. What about other good options? But they're not taking the whole story into account. I, you know, I'll still view it as a story, but it's a true story. But look, look at the ending of the story or near the end, the, the part where he dies on the cross. And people will say, yeah, that's that's a, a good story. And if and if you want to be a Christian, that's cool for you. Uh, I'll go my own way. I'm saying that's wrong uh, because 
if there's a menu of options and it's cool for you to follow Jesus, what that means is that it's cool for you to believe that God sent his son, Jesus, to, to go through a br- brutal, humiliating, incredibly painful, torturous beating, first of all, and then on, and, and, and a horrible death. And that's one of the universe's nice ideas for us. So we can get, our, you know, we get what we want. No, they, that's not one of the universe's nice ideas for us. If, if it's a nice idea on a list of nice ideas, then it's a bad idea. The cross isn't a good idea unless it's the only good idea. God yeah. would not have done that for us if he if he'd had, uh, you know, plan B sitting over there in a corner, too. It reminds me of uh, I'm paraphrasing C.S. Lewis when he said, look, either Christianity is the most important fact in the universe or it's irrelevant. What it can't be is moderately important. Right. Yeah. Either God exists and he came to save us or he didn't. Now, if he did come to save us, then what could be more important than that? We're talking about eternity. Of course, if there is no eternity, there is no ultimate meaning. We're all going to go to heat death and everything you ever done, said or or uh, or did with anybody or to anybody or for anybody will never be remembered and will never have any ultimate significance if everything's going to go to heat death. But if there is, and the universe will go to heat death, it's ultimately going to run out of energy. But if there is a God and there isn't an eternity, then things you do here do really matter, not only now, mm-hmm. but in eternity. Of meaning. Yeah, That's subjective spe- meaning. Yeah, and speaking Jesus of Jesus is the way or he isn't. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. I'm sorry. If no, C- I, I thought, I thought you were trying C- to jump in on me. I was I was rambling there. Go. Did you want- <laughs> I thought you were trying to I jump in. Hey, were- this is my book. Can I talk about it? No, I'm agreeing yeah, no, with no, your no, book. No. <laughs> so it's your program. But if you know, you're speaking of C.S. Lewis, and very famously, he said Jesus not in, did not intend to uh, to leave us an option of him being uh, you know just a good teacher. That's mm. famous. I think Jesus also did not intend to leave us the option where the cross is optional. Yes. You can say the yeah you can't say the cross is an option. It's either the right answer or it's not on the list at all. And so I don't want to hear anybody else saying, "Oh, that's cool for you if you're a believer." And and since he is so good, he's too good to be false. The only right answer is to follow him and to thank him that he died for us and to and to keep following him no matter what. Yeah, Jesus either is the Lord or he isn't. There's no other option. And if he is the Lord, Mm -hmm. we own everything. If he's not, then he's just another teacher along with everybody else. But as you point out in the book, Too Good to Be False, Jesus is not just another character in history. Isn't it interesting, too, Tom, that all the other world religions, or at least most of them, post-Jesus, all want a piece of Jesus, right? (laughs) The Muslims work him into their system. Uh, even more modern day versions of Hinduism want to talk about Jesus. You've got the Baha'is, you've got uh, all of these different worldviews wanting to say something about Jesus and somehow get Jesus on their side. Why do you think that is? Yeah, Craig Hazen, I think, came up with that first. And he's right. It's because he's so great. Now you got Jesus, the social socialist, too, by the way. Yes. Um, that's the big one in the cultural commentary today uh, it's because it's because he stands out he shines he is the, the 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 top example from history i'll even tell skeptics look just read the read read his accounts and if you don't believe in the miracles just just read and see if you think he's a great person to follow and my hope is that if they start following him on that basis they'll realize that he's great more than just a good leader but the lord and how, how, how could he become the most influential human being in history if the resurrection did not occur? Because it was claimed to have occurred. It could have been refuted by going to an empty tomb, and the Jews and the Romans wanted to do that to refute Christianity. But it grew right out of Jerusalem. So it's really mm-hmm. hard for me to, to believe that Jesus is the most influential human being in history if he didn't rise from the dead. It's just too good to be false. Someone should write a book called Too Good to Be False, Tom. Maybe you should take that up. Too Good to Be False is the book, How Jesus' Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. And and Tom, I know you're a big advocate of apologetics. In the back of the book there, you talk about how Christians ought to get involved in apologetics. Why, Why must they? 
Yeah, um, the whole book, I, I didn't mention the word apologetics, but that's a lot of what it is. It's about how great Jesus is, obviously, too. But I, I actually modeled the book on the book of Hebrews, which is written to people in a situation pretty parallel to ours, where you've got a group of believers who are under pressure from the culture to revert to cultural norms. And someone comes along, we don't know who it was, and writes a book, to uh, a letter to encourage them to stick with Jesus. Well, what's he do? He says Jesus is great, but he also gives reasons. And, and you know, you got people who will say, just just believe, just believe. You know, we, we've got it. All you have to do is believe. The author of Hebrews could have done the same thing. He put it in the first paragraph. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the one through whom the worlds were created. That's enough. There you're done. But he kept going and he gave reasons. Now, they're not the same reasons that would impress us because, you know, the, the, the listeners, the, the readers then were into things like the book of Leviticus. And he used that as his reasons. Today, we need to use reasons that are of interest and relevance to people who are listening now. But we need to use reasons if we're going to encourage people to stay in the faith when they're under pressure to walk away. That's what we're doing here at crossexamine.org. I know you're doing it as well at thinkingchristian.net. By the way, the other couple of courses we have coming up online this September, we have a course for college and high school students called, Why well, I Still Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. I will be your instructor if you want to take that course. Uh, we can only take 40 people in the premium course. So when we do the Zoom sessions, the live Zoom sessions, everyone can interact. If you want to be a part of that, go to crossexamine.org, click on online courses. And also we have a turnkey course. If you're a teacher right now and you're trying to figure out how you can teach your kids remotely apologetics, we've got it all online for you already. We can customize the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist course for you just check out the turnkey course, go to crossexamine.org, click on online courses as well. So we got the turnkey course for teachers or small group leaders. We've got why I still don't have enough faith to be an atheist for high school and college students. And we also have how to interpret your Bible starting up uh, as well. And in about the next week, we're going to announce another course from Sean McDowell on how to reach Gen Z. So we've got a lot going on. I know you do as well, Tom. Why don't you sum all this up before we, we sign off here? Uh, well, I, I have to ask you one more question. Skeptics, okay. what are they saying about the book, Too Good to Be False? Right now, they are uh, mostly saying Jesus isn't so good. You know, so they're, they're, they're just trying to set it aside. I'm waiting to hear from the major skeptics, though, and I can only imagine what they're going to come up with. Yeah, well, it's a unique approach. You've really got a unique approach here, Tom. Too Good to Be False is the book, How Jesus' Incom Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. If there was one big idea you wanted people to take away from this book, Tom, what would it be? It's all leading toward the final part where I say Jesus, no matter what, he, he's that good. He, he's that extraordinary. He is worth our worship. He's worth our following. He And, and it's true. It, it, and it's because he's that great. It's because the story. The, the 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 story is true his salvation is true and wherever he takes you whatever you go into whatever whatever goes on in your life he's worth following and so follow him no matter what by the way is there a website people can go to to get more on this Where the best one is think thinkingchristian.net right. is is my home website and it's okay. thinkingchristian.net that's the best uh, one to go to ThinkingChristian.net not only has information on the book, Too Good to Be False, but you've got a blog up here as well that you've been doing since 2004. Were there blogs in 2004, Tom? How old are you? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really old. <laughs> you've been out there a while. And yeah, uh, yeah check out ThinkingChristian.net and you'll see the blog there. You see the podcast. Are you speaking anywhere? Do you have any media events coming up that people can can watch you online? Anything like that? Uh, actually nothing coming up right now. I would, if you go to thinkingchristian.net, I would welcome invitations, place where uh, people can come and, and see, uh, and see if we can work out a, a way for me to come speak with your group online or in person. Yeah, we're doing a lot online as I know you probably are as well. Uh, this mm -hmm. the church I have here locally in Charlotte is meeting. But most of the churches or most of the groups now are meeting online. So we're doing a lot of Zoom. And uh, if you'd like to have Tom uh, talk to your group, you can go to thinkingchristian.net and get in touch with him that way. Tom, it's been a pleasure. Great book. Thanks so much for being on. Thank you, Frank. 
That's Tom Gilson. Again, the book, Too Good to Be False. Trust me, you need to read it. It is a unique take on Jesus and the New Testament documents, so I highly recommend it. I'm Frank Turek. I'll be back here next week, Lord willing. See you then. God bless. If you benefit from this podcast, help others find it. Just go to iTunes or any other podcast service you might be using to listen and leave us a five-star rating on the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast with Dr. Frank Turek. It will take you less than five seconds. You can also help a lot by leaving us a positive review for others to see. This podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many other audio content delivery apps. Thank you and God bless.